welcome to our talk. Um, uh, it's by uh, Annie, who works in, in my team in, as a technical support engineer. She usually works from uh, New Zealand, but is in Sweden now over the summer. And by me, I work as the chief customer officer, which basically means I work mostly with RabbitMQ, helping customers um, and um, using our, our products. So um, CloudMQP is the oldest running RabbitMQ as a service. Uh, it's been doing that since 2012. Uh, we have probably the largest fleet of RabbitMQ clusters in the world. Um, and we automate setup, running, monitoring, and scaling of these clusters uh, so that developers can focus on, on their applications and less on, on running RabbitMQ. Um, we have support teams in Europe, US, where I am, and New Zealand. So we have a 24 um, seven on call um, support team. And um, uh, I just want to mention that if you're interested in exactly how we internally use RabbitMQ to produce more RabbitMQ servers, you can talk, see our talk from the previous conference on uh, exactly that. Um, I should also mention that we um, are, uh, probably handling, just to, to give you um, some, some numbers. Um, I wrote in the, in the abstract that we do 3,000 support um, tickets a year. Uh, I then looked that up yesterday and we're closer to 5,500, I think, now. Um, so since the abstract was, was written, which was for previous conference, uh, it, it's, it's grown a lot. So. Um, there's, there's plenty of, of cases. And these that are, we're going to present today, my messages are lost. My core MQ took all my memory, MQTT server running out of memory, ETS tables uh, eating memory um, are probably like very rare. So I don't, don't want to give, um, if, if you're a newcomer to this, don't want you to to give, get the impression that this is what I will see if I run RabbitMQ, I'm going to have all these obscure issues. This is like very um, more of the obscure type of, of issues, but um, it, it will be useful anyway. And we'll actually round out with some of the most common issues to, to, to look at there too. Right, so uh, let's start with the first uh, scenario for today. And this is a very classic one. It's uh, my messages are lost. And this one happens usually when RabbitMQ has restarted uh, and then you realize you lost messages. Um, but luckily it's easy to make sure that this doesn't happen or are less likely to happen again. So the most common causes of this is that messages are published as transient, which means that they will be thrown away in a rabbit restart. Uh, that and messages uh, are in non-durable queues. Uh, so this means that even though you publish persistent messages, you can still lose them if you publish them to a non-durable queue. So the safest thing here, if you're still using classic queues, are to use uh, both uh, persistent messages to durable queues. And with a multi-node cluster, um, transient messages can still survive uh, a restart since messages are synced between nodes. Uh, but if no uh, high availability policy is applied, then messages will not be synced and they will be lost. So it's important to apply that policy. And the tricky case is even though you have applied the HA policy, you have to be careful about unsynced mirrors. So if a leader node goes down and we have unsynced mirrors, we have to choose if we want high, uh, if we want availability for the cluster or if we want to avoid data loss. So let's say that a leader node goes down and the unsynced mirror node becomes the leader the old leader will then throw away all its messages when it comes back up and syncs, 
uh, with that first mirror that didn't sync the messages in the first uh, place. So the tricky part about this one is that you can still uh, publish persistent messages in durable queues and they will not survive. So then you have to make sure that you configure um, HA promote on failure or promote on shutdown so that um, unsynchronized mirrors don't become leaders. So that's uh, doable. But having said all this, um, quorum queues and maybe later streams, uh, who knows, uh, should be the default choice for a replicated queue. Um, also because uh, classic mirror queues will be removed in a future version of RabbitMQ, as we've learned in this summit. A tweak of this one is uh, when you keep losing messages. And the, the cause for this is most likely missing bindings. And this can happen in a very in a various scenarios, but um, most commonly you're uh, using non-durable exchanges. So when RabbitMQ is restarted, uh, bindings will be lost uh, with those exchanges. So you have to make sure that clients are creating those bindings again or use durable exchanges. And unrouted messages can be monitored uh, by looking at the unroutable drop metric, which was introduced in RabbitMQ 3.8. So here you see some print screens of the RabbitMQ management UI metric and the CloudMQP metric of this. You can also use uh, alternate exchanges in this scenario, um, and then messages can be rerouted or routed to another exchange and then rerouted from there. So what we learned in this scenario is that if you're still using classic queues, make sure to publish persistent messages to durable queues and exchanges and apply the HA policy if you uh, want to keep them in a restart. Sometimes you don't want that, so and you shouldn't be using this. And if you keep losing messages, um, have a look at unroutable metric and check for missing bindings. But having said all this, it's uh, the recommended first choice is still to use quorum queues, since you don't have to worry about uh, persistence, durability, or high availability because it's all by default in quorum queues. So it makes it really easy for you. Uh, but also have a look at for the new streams coming in Rabbit um, 3.9. Sounds like they have a great potential. The second case for today, speaking so much about quorum queues uh, is that we had a customer writing to us that uh, my quorum queue started to backlog and the high memory watermark was hit. In the management interface, the majority of the memory usage was labeled quorum queues, but that's about as much information as I can get. So I'm wondering if there's some configuration option I'm overlooking or not understanding correctly. And this is a really good question. Um, so we wanted to replicate this scenario. Uh, so we published 2 million uh, messages to two different queues, quorum queues. Quorum Q1 had no memory limit, and Quorum Q2 had the max in memory length set to 100. 100. Uh, and that means that uh, there can be a maximum of 100 messages in the memory for this queue. In this case, we also uh, had a look at what happens when we run a full garbage collection, and what memory looks like compared to a classic lazy queue and if it impacted the consumption performance. Uh, so first off, we're looking at the metric process memory bytes for Quorum Q1 compared to Quorum Q2. And so here, Quorum Q1 without the limit uh, is the top line, the, the greenish line, and the Quorum Q2 with the limit is the bottom line. And it's easy to see here that if we don't restrict memory usage for a quorum queue, it can take up a lot of memory. And um, here in the end of the graph, you can see that it kind of flattens out for both, but that's when we stop publishing. So if we didn't stop, or if messages didn't stop uh, backlogging, that memory would just have gone up and up until you don't have any memory left. But on the yellow line, you can see that it's, it's a nice flat line if you restrict it. 
So what happens when we run a full garbage collection in this case? We can see that the quorum queue without a memory limit did release some memory, uh, while the one with, with the limit didn't. So there might be some room for improvements here um, in quorum queues. And if we compare this to a classic lazy queue, we can see that there's a big difference uh, in, in memory uh, usage. So does it affect the consumption? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, because uh, quorum Q1 is keeping all of its messages in memory. Uh, so it, it processes messages faster than quorum Q2 which has to reread messages from its raft log. Uh, so that makes it um, a little bit more heavy. So what we learned here is that use maxim memory lengths or maxim memory bytes for quorum queues because they are using more memory than classic lazy queues, for example. We also saw that garbage collection did free up some memory um, for, the, for the first quorum queue. Consumption rates can be affected if you're having a big backlog of messages in quorum queues. Uh, and lastly, we also want to thank the RabbitMQ team for helping in investigating this issue. It helped a lot. So thank you for that. Over to Yuan. Okay, um, the next case we're going to look at is uh, one where um, a user was um, or a customer was using the MQTT plugin and it was eating all of the memory. It involves uh, tuning for large number of connections and a special look at um, a subsystem called MQTT mode. Um, so the uh, initial issue here was uh, on RabbitMQ 3.8.9 um, and they had 50 to 60,000 connections, 50,000 queues, uh, but a pretty low throughput, you could say with two to 3,000 messages per second. And they had been running out of memory repeatedly with their in-house uh, cluster. Uh, they moved over to Cloud AMQP and had the same uh, issues. So if we look at this in the uh, uh, management interface, you can see those uh, churns here, which are uh, not good, but it's not like super bad, uh, but you can see that the memory is already 118 uh, gigabytes out of basically um, 200 for the watermark and then a little bit higher for the, the total uh, that the machine had with those uh, queues, connections, um, and a lot of exchanges, a lot of channels. Um, so what's using all that RAM? Well, if you bring up uh, the diagnostics interface, you can see that there's, there are three um, uh, suspects here, which have very long message queues, MQTT node, error logger, and credentials obfuscation. Uh, so this is a good tip if you're uh, investigating something is to look at it in diagnostics and look at the internal message queue if there's something that's being backed up there that usually indicates that something is, is, uh, is wrong. So uh, before doing all of that, uh, we have a customer with, with uh, thousands of <laughs> their customers that are not happy. So um, identify the main, main issue, and it's that this MQTT node is, is getting filled up. Uh, we used the test system to check that restarting this internal process, and this is kind of what, what makes Erlang so fantastic, is that we are able to restart this sub-process without restarting everything, and uh, the system keeps on run, running. So we had we couldn't run with this, but we could at least limp along until uh, we figured more things out. So we begin with the credentials obfuscation. This is a feature that was added in RabbitMQ 3.8, I think. Not, not exactly sure when it, when it was added, probably a little bit earlier. Uh, but what it does, it's, it obfuscates passwords from being logged. And this is in general, a very good thing uh, because it protects uh, credentials to, to end up in, in logs. And um, that's all good. 
Uh, but the default was very taxing in scenarios where you had a lot of um, uh, a lot of connections being created at the same time. So this could be uh, tuned, and we submitted a pull request for that to to change the default there. That's been accepted. So you so today you don't no longer need to worry about this. The other thing is that error logger. You can safely uh, switch that. If, if you have a lot of, of um, connection setups and, and, and uh, teardowns, you can safely switch it to error for the time being. Uh, and that way you'll have a lot less churn because you're not logging every uh, connection attempt. So then for MQTT node, um, the central theme here is um, we started with creating a, a repo for reproducing this issue. And that's the one here. You can access it. It's, it's public, 84 codes, MQTT connections. And this has come in handy now for more, more than one case. Um, and that one um, creates a lot of connections and, and recreates this, this scenario. Uh, using that, we can uh, look at the stack trace and see what MQTT node is up to. Um, and then see which uh, which part of it is is handling this, and it's in the MQTT machine and uh, handling the the teardowns uh, of connections uh, is wasn't very optimized. Um, so we had this in the discussion, and Carl Nilsson uh, fixed this. So uh, big uh, shout outs to him for for um, finding and, and fixing that issue. Um, if if you want, here's an example of tuning uh, MQTT for, um, for this type of, of, of scenario. So this credential obfuscation, you, you no longer need to, to enter because there is a, is a good default now. Uh, you can turn down the TCP buffers. These are much bigger by default. Uh, so you can keep more connections um, without using as much RAM. Uh, and we also turned off most of so this disabled stats. True, disables almost everything. Um, this was an enable queue totals was an, introduced in 383. Uh, you can then see just the number of messages in queues, but this management will look very, very uh, barren if, if you do this. After this fix, we could safely turn, turn it back on. Um, coming soon, so, um, Based out of this work, um, we realized that it it's, would be helpful to have a bridge server, kind of a, 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 an edge node uh, that sits in between uh, the client and RabbitMQ. Uh, so we're going to uh, soon release MyraMQ. Uh, this is Myra means uh, ant in Swedish, and it alludes to that this is a very small um, implementation um, has a very small footprint, but can carry a lot of weight in, in the sense that it can handle hundreds of thousands of connections without issues. It's written in Crystal, which is a new newish uh, programming language, and it can run on the same node as RabbitMQ or completely standalone. And we envision this being you have a few of these edge nodes where MQTT handling session uh, is set up. And then you bridge it into RabbitMQ for the actual message handling um, and having the consumers there. So uh, what we learned, identify main issues, find temporary solution, and create a rep uh, repo for reproduction. The next one is in the same vein with, with memory uh, usage. Uh, but at this point, it was instead ETS tables that were slowly growing. And this was in RabbitMQ 3.8.7 uh, with Erlang 22. Um, so looking at the memory trend there, we could see, or the customer um, could see that uh, memory was slowly growing until they did a restart and then um, memory usage kept on growing again. Most of this was in tables other. And if, if you've spent some time with RabbitMQ, there is, very rarely that it's warranted to have a lot of stuff in tables other. Um, yeah. So th this points to something being being off. Um, so then you can, you know, look at this in RabbitMQ Diagnostics or uh, RabbitMQ Top, as in the case here. Um, and you can see what exactly is the, the, the table. So it was PG2 table. And we tried 
you know, the usual suspects, garbage collection, restarting the management interface and so on. And that didn't free up uh, any of this uh, memory. Um, and uh, Luke Bakken um, replied on the RabbitMQ users list. And so I got a command that I could use on a test server to inspect these tables manually. I didn't want to, to inspect 460 megabytes of them at, at once, but I could, could inspect them uh, on, uh, on a test server. And trying that on a test cluster, we could see um, exactly what was uh, in those, um, uh, or we could see at least hinting at it being something with a federation. And uh, this user was using or had a federation policy applied to their queues. So again, create a case for reproducing. Um, so here they were using Celery and Celery has some default options that creates queues automatically, it destroys them, um, which is not good. And especially if, if you have this federation policy. So here's a re reproducing code. It's very easy. It just creates queues. Um, expires messages and then expires the queue and then does that over and over again. Um, this together with a federation policy caused uh, this to be this entry to be added in each um, in this PG2 table. So um, this was reported and uh, thanks to Luke for helping me reproduce it and then to Diana uh, that fixed it and it's fixed in 3.8.10. So you don't need to worry about this. If you had this issue, you could also just disable federation policy after when you're done uh, using it. And then we took it further and scanned all our servers for, for this and identified three other customers that we could then contact and say, hey, uh, turn off this policy or, or upgrade. So that was a very good uh, outcome there. So again, identify the main issue, uh, collaborate with the community to track down what it's causing it and make it easy to reproduce. Yeah, so last time uh, CloudMQP had a talk at the summit, uh, Anders and Lovisa showed some RabbitMQ statistics uh, from all our clusters. So we wanted to give you a quick update on that. Um, there was one question about how popular the sharding plugin is. And for Cloud MQP users, we can see that it's not very popular. Um, only 0.27% has it activated. Um, and on the right here, um, we can see that uh, we can see what RabbitMQ major version our clusters are running as a percentage. And so a majority of the clusters are running uh, RabbitMQ version 3.8. But if we look at uh, how many that are actually using Quorum queues, it turns out that not a lot of Cloud MQP clusters are running Quorum queues. So there's definitely room for uh, our customers to uh, adopt Quorum queues. So we talked a little bit about these um, kind of rare issues that few users see. Um, but what are the most common issues? And these are the ones that, that we see um, a lot. For instance, um, if we start from the bottom, not using a prefetch, this is um, kind of a bad default in, in many clients to not set a default prefetch. And um, that um, can cause additional RAM usage on the server or um, maybe more likely clients crashing and um, starting uh, and then using an unlimited prefetch again. So they just keep on in, in that loop. Um, RabbitMQ is kind of too good for its own. Uh, so there's a lot of very old versions floating around. We see this um, all the time on the RabbitMQ mailing lists where, where there's very old um, rabbits that are in desperate need for, for upgrades. Um, timeouts, this, this was added in 3.8.15, I think, um, with uh, originally 15 minutes, then was bumped to 30 minutes. Uh, we configure it to be an hour or two hours now for, for all our um, uh, servers. Uh, connection churn um, is a very common issue that um, 
basically developers are treating RabbitMQ as a database um, and um, opening a connection, a channel for each, maybe even a queue for each message. And that, that's um, very resource um, hungry. Um, in a similar vein, connection channels, queues are never uh, closed. So you, you would have, have um, a rise in, in, um, in these. Uh, <laughs> and maybe one of the most, most common ones are preconditioned failed where, where a uh, developer hasn't thought of certain scenarios. Um, maybe they don't recreate queues. Um, maybe they don't um, uh, recreate bindings or maybe the most common of these is that uh, there is some issue with double acting or uh, not acting with the correct uh, delivery tag. It's very common. Um, similarly, as we had heard in the uh, in the client session, uh, missing heartbeats is uh, very common or missing um, something else like missing publisher confirms or not understanding what 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 those means. Um, and that was the last uh, slide, actually. So I think we're right on time for uh, Q and A. Thank you, Hananani. Uh, yes, we have uh, time for questions, although uh, we haven't received a lot. So uh, please uh, uh, visit the Whoa app and uh, post your questions there. Um, while we are waiting for other questions to arrive, we have one from uh, Piotr. Yeah, if you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. So essentially, my question is, what is the most common tuning that you need to perform for your customers, uh, uh, either for the RabbitMQ itself or the Erlang VM, VM even? Hmm. Um, I think um, there is. Uh, which ones do we change the most? Um, I'm gonna say heartbeats. Yeah, because we, that, that's we don't recommend it, so, but we still have it configured. Um, yeah. So turning heartbeat off is very common. Yeah, especially for Node.js AMQP lib users where they override what the, um, yeah, there's, there's an issue there. Um, it used to be very common to do, um, to, to look at Q index embed uh, to turn that up or down depending on, on uh, message size, but that is not so frequent anymore. Uh, that's a setting that splits out um, which, which messages go the fast route into the Q index and which ones go the, the slower route into to the um, uh, message store persistent. Um, yeah, we also have like fairly common is to use uh, um, the HTTP uh, auth backend to configure that one. I think that one is, is um, yeah, it's just something we haven't automated yet that we need to automate. Yeah. And for, um, for tuning um, the Erlang VM, it might be the uh, buffer size. Um, you. Uh, the next question, Michael, please. Yeah, sorry, folks. Uh, I hope you can hear me now. So, in your opinion, uh, why does less than two percent of the user base or a customer base use quorum queues if? Over 60% are on 3.8. For the most part, quorum queues are fairly mature. There is only one missing feature or uh, a desired feature. Um, otherwise, on the rapid and team, we don't really see that many reasons to use classic mirrored queues. So why do you think quorum queues get so little use across yeah. the universe? Yeah, I thought about that, and I think there is, um, or I, I think the main issue is inertia. Like people have been using 
the old stuff and um, it's been the the default and all the tutorials all all the examples everything is using the old stuff um and uh yeah i, I think that's the, the biggest um the next question uh matt green hi yes uh just a, a comment on the previous uh, point. I think our guys are struggling to go to quorum queues because they're under time pressure and they don't feel the advantage. You know, it's it's a matter of selling them, telling them they, what they're going to get from it. Um, you know, the developer says, "Well, you know, it works now. What's the problem?" Um, anyway, that's a by the by. Um, my question was um, being relatively new to RabbitMQ. Uh, we, we read some exciting things about 3.9 or were presented some exciting things about 3.9 um, yesterday. Obviously, it's it's early days. H how do you bring that into your ecosystem? Do you, you, mean, do you run it up on your test servers, play around with it, uh, just wait six months and hope that somebody else do it? <laughs> how does it work for you? So the question is, is uh, how do we internally handle upgrades? Yes, or... yes. Because um, so um, what we do is we have um, as soon as there's a new uh, beta release candidate out, we run it through an internal pipeline of testing. Um, and then once the real uh, sharp release is out, uh, we put a beta flag on it uh, and then some of our customers can try it out and we can try it out. And we go through a pipeline of like making sure that our upgrades work and and uh, uh, plan changes work with with each version, and then we start. Then, then we roll it out so you can you can select it if you know what 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 you <laughs> what you want, and then after a while uh, we just make that one the default version. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, plural, uh, goes to Gerhard. What is the weirdest RabbitMQ bug that you've experienced? Uh, I think th I posted this one. I, um, bad flying ETS update. Um, it's pretty weird. Um, uh, there is also this one with... Um, uh, where queue, queue bindings exist, but Rabbit doesn't, um, this, this one is locked. Um, queue bindings exist, but Rabbit doesn't think they exist. So I th that, that's probably an amnesia issue. Um, yeah. Okay. What was the ETS one? I missed the first part. The, the bad flying ETS update, it... it um, there's something in bhost starting that uh, that fails um, and uh, yeah and I, I found a workaround I wrote it to, to the RabbitMQ users list but it's it's um, that's um, very very ob obscure and I mean I, we've only seen it five times or something so okay thank you Irina. Uh, yeah, can you read your question, please? Um, in that case, uh, I will read your question. In next RabbitMQ version, uh, if next RabbitMQ version will not support classic queues, uh, I probably she meant uh, classic queue mirroring because classic queues will uh, be still there. Then it will postpone upgrade to most of your users. Uh, does uh, is it not a too radical step to decide? And I probably you are still a users of RabbitMQ, but uh, uh, it's an interesting question. So uh, classic queue mirroring is still the dominant one, and quorum queues are not uh, uh, not that popular. Uh, do you do you try to push users towards quorum queues actively? 
Yeah. So yeah. So yes, we, we try to to push users towards uh, using that. And um, you know, I mean, if you really want to, I mean, classic queues are, are still good in the non-replicated case. Uh, so you can and you can still use use that perfectly fine. So I, I think I think that's not. I don't think. I yeah famous last words but i don't think it's going to be such a big issue as we might think today and i mean and we never like push our customers or force them to upgrade so as you see as you saw in the statistics we still have customers running three three so it's uh we're never gonna force anyone i think to upgrade we just recommend <laughs> And before uh, letting Gerhard ask another question, I have another one. Auto heal or pause minority? A pause minority, if possible. Do you see a lot of uh, network partitions? This used to be a big issue, um, you know, a few years ago. Today, no. Jochen, may I comment on why that may be? Yes, I have the same impression. So with Erlang 22, I think, they introduced chunking for internet communication. And it turns out a lot of, uh, you know, no down kind of events that are translated to partitions uh, that, you know, uh, higher levels, they were false positives. So a shocking percentage of rabbit and two network partition events were just overloaded distribution links and then this is much less of an issue uh, today with, with modern or long freezes. Yeah. Can I add a comment to Michael's comment? <laughs> yes, please. Um, that's one of the reasons why streams are so fast. They don't use the Erlang distribution. If they were, they would overload it. The network partitions would come back and they could not sustain the maximum throughput that they do today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and like a, a comment on a meta comment on, on that is like throughout this talk, we, we three out of the four issues was was memory, but that's that, that's kind of a false um, indicator. Like most of the issues now are like three four years ago, most of the issues were memory issues, uh, and I talked to Gerhard at the first RabbitMQ summit about this, um, and. Today, that's not the case anymore. Like memory uh, handling is much better in modern Erlang and modern RabbitMQ. So, um, I mean, th there are these obscure cases that we looked at today, which are, are intriguing and interesting, but they're, it, it's not the most common thing that RabbitMQ runs out of memory uh, anymore. That, that's like a, a three, three, five, three, six type issue. It's not a three, nine, zero issue, fingers crossed. And it's good to know that the memory optimizations which we did specifically in Erlang for RabbitMQ really helped. It just took a while for everybody to get all those updates. Uh, the Erlang team themselves, we worked closely with them to improve certain things and more improvements are coming. So it will improve and we're keeping a close eye on that. But again, with streams, you shouldn't have that problem because the messages don't even enter the Erlang VM. There's no garbage collection. There's no allocation, none of that if you use the stream protocol. If you don't use the stream protocol, well, you'll you'll find out. Yeah. And Gerhard, you had another question about single node rabbits. Yeah, what uh, rabbit if you feature, if you can think of one that your users are, are missing the most from the perspective of support, from the perspective what was discussed here, not in general. What's your take, Annie? It's a tricky one. I think, or I hope, like we're going to introduce an open source uh, way that makes it very easy to to store things in, like uh, blob storage. Um, so maybe that's um, something. One thing which we were discussing is about enabling users to maybe report issues straight from Rabbit. 
So we were wondering whether from the perspective of support, if users could report when an issue happened from Rabbit, you know, as you can, like your Mac crashes, send a diagnostic. Maybe that would help. I don't know. We're just mm. guessing here. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So uh, another like internal promotion. So um, uh, we did uh, some user interface changes to make it more apparent to or more easy to spot how easy it is to 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 upgrade RabbitMQ inside our um, interface. So that's like things like that to 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 make make more users run latest versions. I think will will. Uh, will have a big benefit. That sounds like a great feature that we would like to promote as well so that users can upgrade. You know how Docker does it? We don't want to do that. Docker for desktop specifically. We don't want to do that. If you're free, you have to upgrade. No, we don't want to do that. But uh, promoting users to upgrade, it would be good to know how you do it so that we can yep. do something similar. So mm -hmm. it would help everybody. 